Hello, everybody. Today's video is on a topic that I have a sneaking suspicion many of you gardeners can relate to, and that is my never-ending, ever-expanding garden to-do list. And I'm shooting this video today as much to share with you all as it is to hold my own self accountable to actually getting some or most of these projects done in 2023. Now I'm happy to say that the first item on the list, I'm pretty close to actually having complete already. And that's in this area of the garden right here. The first portion was the creation of a new strawberry bed. My old one was overgrown and needed rejuvenated. Plus, no matter how many strawberries I plant, it seems like we always need more. So I've added a couple more beds up in the front of my garden. As soon as the temperatures warm up a little, I'll be transplanting starts from various spots all over the property to these prepped beds. Now I started with one bed up here last year, but at the time this whole section was outside the garden fence and my chickens nearly destroyed the small planting of berries that was here. And that led to project number two, which was changing the layout of my garden fencing. Between chickens and rabbits and other critters, I have to have my strawberries fenced in or I basically don't get any. The same goes for pretty much any other edible food that I plant out here. So the easiest fix for me was shifting the existing fence. I just snipped it off where I wanted it with the wire cutters and shifted the whole fence out this direction to help protect those new strawberry beds. And while I was at it, I tackled another long-standing issue in my garden, which was the need for a wider access point and gate. Now I mentioned in a video earlier this year that what I would do differently in the garden video, that one of my biggest complaints was that I did not have an access point in this fenced in portion of the garden wide enough to get my wagon through. And it was difficult at times to maneuver even my wheelbarrow. It was something that in hindsight, I wish that I had changed, but I saw an opportunity with this change up to remedy the issue. As you can see here, I've put in a cattle panel arch to cover this whole space. And this way I can still utilize some of this growing area by growing vertically. And this gives me a nice wide access point. For the time being, I've got the entrance closed off with chicken wire, but eventually my husband will be building a nice solid permanent wooden gate to close off this space. And when I laid this out, I made sure to pull my wagon through here, move my wheelbarrow through here to make sure that I had plenty of room. And this works really well now, but as is the way of things so often, one improvement led me to the realization that I needed to make yet another improvement, and that was to widen my actual garden path. So back in this area where the new path meets the existing garden, this is where I'm running into issues. My paths get very, very narrow back in here and it gets difficult to maneuver around. So what you see here is the old strawberry bed. I'm going to basically come through here and make a nice big wide path. There are a few strawberry plants left in there. I'll transplant those to the new garden beds and that will allow me a lot more room through this section. Now I've also got to rethink the layout of some of these raised beds over here. This actually works out pretty well because as you can see, these raised beds are in rough shape. Unfortunately, years ago when these were made and I was faced with the price of cedar boards, I cheaped out and went with untreated pine. What you see going on here is the result of about five years of weathering. It's only going to be a matter of time before the rest of these go, and I am not looking forward to replacing these, especially the double deckers over here. And I'm kicking myself a bit because buying cedar boards five or six years ago would have been significantly cheaper than buying them today. Now the two here in the front are the very first beds that I put into the garden. And I made the very bad mistake of putting woven landscape fabric underneath this entire area and filling these beds with bagged soil. I'll be sharing what I do to fix these beds and why these were such bad mistakes in an upcoming video, so stay tuned. But these will both definitely be coming out of here this year. This front one is in the worst shape and this will be coming out of here as soon as possible. And the second one will come out as soon as I am done rooting these elderberry cuttings and get these transplanted elsewhere. Now, in addition to moving and changing these beds, Another project is the creation of yet more beds. I keep telling myself every year, you do not need more garden beds. I can't seem to stop. I'm gonna take you over here to show you the beds I've been working on so far. But first, I wanna take just a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video and the provider of today's lunch, Green Chef. 
Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic company. It's a meal kit delivery service which provides options for every lifestyle. Keto and paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean and gluten free. I've got three delicious keto and paleo meals this week, and it's a hard decision, but for today's lunch, I think I'm gonna go with the Cuban chicken with chimichurri. This time of year in particular, when I've got a few more months to wait for my own garden fresh produce, because I didn't do a good job planning my overwintered plantings last year, I love the convenience and quality of Green Chef meals. They provide premium proteins and farm fresh organic produce like the crisp, sweet snap peas and cabbage in today's lunch, so I can feel good about what I'm eating and how it got to my table, even if it's not coming out of my own garden. Green Chef also saves me a trip to the grocery, which anymore I try to avoid at all costs. I was also happy to discover that Green Chef creates less food waste than retail grocery stores, and it's the only meal kit that is both plastic and carbon offset. But most importantly, how does it taste? Every meal I've tried has been delicious, and this Cuban chicken is no exception. Now, if you're interested in trying out Green Chef for yourself, use my code GROWFULLY60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Go to greenchef.com for more details. Now, back to the garden projects. So I am slowly working on framing in more beds outside of the garden fence. I started working on these several years back, just slowly adding organic matter, leaf mulch, wood chips, whatever I had on hand, with the idea that eventually I would use these beds for planting, but I wasn't in a big rush. For the most part, I just had my potted plants sitting here. But a couple of months ago, I received a shipment from Chip Drop. If you're not familiar, it's a service that connects you with tree trimming companies and you can get free loads of wood chips. Well, the load that I received had quite a few big chunks of logs in them, and I decided to put them to use here. It's not the most manicured garden look because all of these logs are mismatched, but I preferred using what I had on hand, and once this is full of plants, no one's going to notice the mismatched logs anyway. I was having trouble with my chickens getting in here and really liking to dig and kick up all of this soil and wood chips and all the stuff that were in these beds out all over the place and just basically making a huge mess. So by framing this in, it definitely helps to keep the beds contained. It's going to help prevent runoff when there's heavy spring rains, and it just makes it easier to maintain around the beds as well. Like I mentioned earlier, anything outside of the fence is fair game for critter nibbling. So rather than plant more edibles out here, I plan to focus more on plants for pollinators and medicinal herbs in these areas. I've got this side all framed in, and next I'm going to work on extending this out to meet the corner. And the final project for this garden this year is doing a better job planning permanent infrastructure for season extension. As you can see, it's pretty bare out here. In a typical year, I do a better job of overwintering a mix of veggies, including onions, brassicas, root crops, and herbs like cilantro and parsley. But this year, with the exception of this spinach and this kale over here, which refuses to die, I lost pretty much everything to a cold snap in early December. So a big project for me this year is focusing on better solutions for overwintering. If you've watched any of my cool season gardening videos, you've probably seen the hoops and frost blanket setup that I typically rely on. This works really well, but it's a bit of a pain to move around. And sometimes if we get a really heavy snow, which rarely happens anymore, the tunnels can collapse. My goal this year is to have some of the permanent hinged hoop houses or raised bed covers built for my raised beds. Eventually I'd like a four season hoop house out here too, but that might have to be a goal for 2024. I've got a few projects going on outside the main gardens as well. The first and probably most pressing this year is finding a more efficient way to heat this greenhouse. I don't need much. Basically, the only time I try to run heat out here is when I'm hardening off seedlings and the temperatures are still dropping below freezing. For the last three or four years, I've just used a small electric space heater. And that works, 
But in the last couple of months, the price that we're paying for electric has doubled. So it's become critical that I find a better solution. Eventually, my dream is to have a much larger passive solar greenhouse. But it's just that at this point. It's a dream. So right now I'm focused on making this one better. Now, this is a twin wall polycarbonate greenhouse, and it actually is quite efficient at retaining heat, much, much better than my single walled greenhouse up on the back patio. And I've been researching, but frankly, I'm a little overwhelmed by the number of different heating options out there. So if anyone has a small greenhouse, say a six by six or six by eight, something comparable to this, and you're really happy with the heat source that you're using, please share that. Now I've used bubble wrap in here, putting it along the bottom two thirds of the greenhouse to help improve insulation, but I've never gotten a really true read on how much that is helping. And it's a lot of extra plastic waste. I'd love to incorporate more more materials that will absorb heat during the day and then release it at night. Brick, stone, water barrels, things like that. But space is at a premium here, so I really have to be thoughtful with where I'm putting these things. A couple of ideas that I'm tossing around for right now is actually laying a brick floor in here. It won't be perfect, but I think I can manage just setting brick down on top of the existing gravel and then just filling old milk jugs with water and placing them underneath these shelves wherever I have space. A friend recently asked me if I'd ever heard of phase change material which I hadn't, but that seems to hold a lot of promise as well. You can get tiles for greenhouses that do the same thing. They naturally absorb heat and then release it when it's needed. And they're supposedly much more efficient than using something like water barrels. I love to play around with putting those tiles on the bottom half of this greenhouse and seeing how that improves things. So that might be something that's happening this year. We'll see. And what is probably the biggest project here this year, the flower beds. They're not flower beds. I just call them that because that's what everyone here calls any beds that are around the house, no matter what is growing in them. But these beds around the house have never gotten much attention. They were okay at best. And then we had construction done and we've got two dogs that tear them up. And I'd basically just given up all hope. But there's a lot of wasted potential space for plants here. But unlike my garden, which receives full sun, most of these areas around the house are impartial to full shade. So I need to think outside of the proverbial garden box. This isn't gonna be the best spot for your traditional garden veggies that need a lot of sun but there are a lot of edible plants that will do well here. My ideal focus here is looking at native perennials and shrubs, plants that are gonna provide food and shelter for wildlife, as well as fruit plants that will do well in partial shade. Right now, I'm looking at options such as gooseberries and currants, wild strawberries, pawpaws, elderberries, black raspberries, and hardy kiwi. I'm also taking cues from the woods that surround us as to which plants will naturally grow well here. So I'm not spending time babying things that don't love this spot. Things like red buds, American plum, and spice bush should do well. And I recently discovered the North Spore Company, which provides all things mushrooms related, and I'm really excited to potentially set up some mushroom beds in this area. I've been a fungi forager my entire life, but I've never actually tried to cultivate mushrooms. So I'm excited for this experiment. Changing this space is definitely a long-term project, but it's one that I have put off for a long time. I've honestly been a little intimidated. I can jump right into a vegetable garden with no problem, but somehow the permanent perennial nature of the plants that I wanna use here makes me feel like I have no room for mistakes. And I just need to totally change that mindset. I tend to overthink, and this year I'm just gonna jump in and do it. For those of you who have been following along with the channel for a while, you may know that I garden over here at my mom and pop's place too. My mom and dad are avid lifetime gardeners and I am very lucky to be able to learn from them. And they are also constantly tackling new projects over here. Now, it makes me laugh a little. I know the term food forest has become quite trendy in the horticultural world, but it's not a new phenomenon. This has been around for a really long time. But my dad has created his own sort of little food forest here, almost by accident. 
For over three decades, Dad has just been randomly planting and letting volunteers grow back here, just kind of watching, observing what happens and changes through the years. And what he's ended up with back here, we've nicknamed it the wilderness, but there's all kinds of interesting plants. He's got apples and pears and walnuts. There's goldenrod and brambles and grasses. And really, other than to just cut some walking paths through here, he pretty much has been hands off with all of this. The strong grow and thrive, and sometimes plants get outcompeted and they die. But it's a really interesting, ever changing sort of ecological experiment. Now, in the spirit of this type of planting, I want to extend this to some of our other growing areas, just being a little more intentional with what I'm planting because there are some specific fruits that I would really like to grow. Obviously this will be a long-term project but for this year I have planned some plantings of things like Ukrainian almonds, cornelian cherries, mulberries, gomi berries, and raspberries. Now it'll be interesting to compare and contrast the plants that can do well here versus at my own home because even though we're only a few miles apart, as you can see, my parents' property here is different. It's a lot more exposed, open. There's a lot more wind, a lot more sunlight as compared to my relatively sheltered and wooded property. So I should be able to maintain two pretty diverse sets of plantings. I also want to continue here with something that mom and dad have started and that's planting intentional windbreaks around the property. As you can see, they've got some lovely mature plantings on the east and the west of the property, but a lot of this in the back is still exposed. These windbreaks come in really, really useful because as you can probably tell today, it's windy and it's always windy here. Plus we're surrounded by agricultural fields and having some windbreak plantings will help a little bit with the spray drift issues. Overall soil improvement continues to be a big task here as well. Much of this ground was conventionally farmed in the past and it's naturally heavy in clay with a hard pan layer underneath. So as you can imagine, that presents a lot of challenges. Improving drainage and soil tilth is a goal that we are constantly striving toward. The beds up in the front, we've gotten pretty good shape but the beds toward the back are another issue. They hold water much longer than they should and are overrun with aggressive, persistent weeds, many of which are indicative of those underlying soil issues. When we started in the back, this was all given a one-time tillage. I then covered this with a silage tarp to help smother out weeds the first season. Since then, it's been planted in several rounds of cover crop. I've used a mix of covers, including things like sunflowers, cowpeas, winter rye, tiller radish, and sorghum sudan grass. I'll continue with cover cropping, as well as focusing on the addition of organic matter, such as aged cow manure, leaf mulch, grass clippings, and composted wood chips. It won't be an immediate fix, but over the course of two or three years, we should see big improvements. In the meantime, I can still do crops like corn, squash, and okra back here, and they tend to do fine. You can see over here, I've got another silage tarp still in place. I actually had this bed in pretty good shape, but after the garlic harvest last year, I let the weeds get a bit out of control. I knocked down all the weeds in the buckwheat cover crop that was planted here late summer and covered the whole area with a tarp. That's all been rotting down underneath here. I'm very curious to see what this looks like now. So it's pretty wet under here. I'll let this dry out a bit. And then my plan is to plant a blend of cool season cover crops and corn will go in here late May to early June sometime. And last but not least, my final big project over here at mom and dad's is more hugel culture. I'm a big fan of hugel culture, especially in problematic areas. And in this bed in particular, we actually suspect that there may be a broken drain tile underneath here. All of the other beds around here are fine. This one just stays wet, will not drain. It's very heavy, very compacted, and it is overrun with thistle. And thistle is often indicative of compacted soil and anaerobic conditions. I've been told that one way to get rid of thistle is to allow them to get just to the bloom stage and then cut them back, repeating this process every time they grow back. Cutting them at this stage forces them to pull energy reserves from their root systems, and eventually it weakens the plant enough to totally kill it. 
So we went through this process about three times last year, and while it did seem to slightly reduce their populations, I suspect it would take about three years to see a really significant reduction. So we're gonna continue to do this, but I also wanted to tackle the underlying soil problems. So I've opted to start using hugel culture in this bed. I like using hugel culture in problem areas like this for a couple of reasons. The first of which is that it allows me to introduce a lot of good organic matter. So obviously with the logs that I'm using, and then also I just kind of throw whatever I have on hand in these trenches. We've been using a mix of kitchen scraps, compost, leaf mulch, grass clippings, filling this trench up. Come a little bit later in the spring, I will move all of the topsoil back on top of this mound. And as that all rots down, that's going to significantly increase the amount of microbial activity that's going on underneath there. It's also going to encourage things like earthworms. So overall, it really helps to rejuvenate soil that is kind of just dead. The other thing I like about it is that it's raising my planting area up. So while I'm not addressing those underlying drainage issues, there's still a broken tile or whatever is going on underneath there. But because I'm raising the planting area, I'm getting my plant roots up and out of that area of poor drainage. Now, this is a relatively small area. I'm probably going to end up with three hugel culture beds here, but my goal eventually is to build more and larger beds. I'm still obsessed with the the schooner farms replication of the great serpent mound using hugel culture. <laughs> I I saw that years ago and I've always kind of wanted to do it myself. So, I don't know if that's a 2023 project, but definitely more hugel culture coming to mom and dad's place for sure. So, I've got a lot to do. I'm going to stop talking and start working. Let me know about your projects for 2023. It is always fun to hear from you all. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.